I'm Dan Rundy. I hold the Schreier Chair here at CSIS, and I also co-direct the U.S. Leadership and Development Project here at CSIS, uh, which is in partnership with Chevron. And this is, as part of the U.S. Leadership and Development Project, we have a what's called the Chevron Forum Series, and this, this conversation around impact investing is part of the, uh, the Chevron Forum, and so we're particularly grateful to our friends at Chevron for helping make this happen. Um, the prompting of this conversation was uh, a breakfast uh, that several of my colleagues and I had with Paul Brest, who's the former president of the uh, William and uh, the Flora and William William and Flora Hewlett, Hewlett Foundation. Uh, and if for those of you who haven't seen it, uh, Paul Brest uh, has written a very interesting paper about what can inve impact investing create. How when can impact investing create real impact? And I think it also speaks to. Uh, Paul Bress's work on measurement and evaluation and impact. He's um, written a book called Money Well Spent that some of you have read. And if you haven't uh, read the book, I recommend that you buy it at retail on Amazon.com and read it. Um, we had a very interesting conversation uh, earlier this morning about measurement and evaluation. And I think it. I think. His, his take on impact investing, I think, reflects sort of his many years as leading the, uh, the Hewlett Foundation uh, and thinking about the issues of impact. And so he looked at this issue of impact investing from, a, um, from, a, from the concept of impact as opposed to, say, from a concept of sort of investing. And so I think that's where he, his, his uh, jumping off point is on, on the topic. And as he says up front in his paper that he's, He's not an impact investor, but he's but he's somebody who's looked at looked at the field, and I think is got some very interesting insights to share with us. We then have a, a series of pan Washington-based panelists because what I said to Paul was, "Look, um, we're in Washington. There's a lot of energy around this this discussion about impact investing. I think the fact that everybody is showing up on on, the, uh, on an afternoon like uh, this one, I think, reflects the energy. There's been a lot of." Uh, effort by the Obama administration to to find ways to um, to uh, support the growth of impact investing, and there have also been a series of things before the Obama administration to uh, to support uh, impact investing, whether it's at the International Finance Corporation or USAID or at OPIC, uh, through things like the Development Credit Authority and uh, through a variety of other uh, instruments and approaches. So uh, we have uh, three very thoughtful people who will be uh, providing, in essence, a response to Paul's presentation, but also a, a chance for us to have a jumping off point for a, discuss a broader discussion among the panel, but also uh, with this very thoughtful and expert uh, audience that we have with us. So um, we have Agnes Dashowitz, who is with uh, USAID, who runs a very interesting program that you'll hear about. Uh, and she used to work with Harold Rosen. Uh, Harold runs the Grassroots Business Fund and is an alum along with Agnes of, of IFC. And then we have Ambassador John Simon, who is a former U.S. Ambassador of the African Union, but also uh, relevant to this conversation, uh, was Executive Vice President at OPIC and now runs something called Total Impact Advisors. So we have a very interesting uh, group uh, in front of us, and also we have a, a great audience. So without further ado, I'm going to um, turn the floor over to Paul Brest. Paul, the floor is yours. Thanks for having me. It's really a pleasure to be here. I'm going to run through these slides very quickly because I think that what's most interesting is for us to then to start a conversation and for you to participate in it. I just should say that this is uh, these slides go with an article that's about to come out in the in the late summer or fall in the Stanford Social Innovation Review, um, and the the editor of the review sent it out for uh, comments to about. 15 people, and uh, Harold Rosen was one of the commentators. I'm actually, my, my co-author, who is a fellow at the Hewlett Foundation, and I are now supposed to comment on the comments. So maybe your comments will help us comment on the comments, and then, of course, the commentators, may, so on and so forth. OK, so um, I don't want to focus too much on the definition, because I think the argument shouldn't be about the definition. So this is an intentionally broad definition of impact investing. Actively placing capital in enterprises that generate social, environmental, good services, or other benefits, with expected returns ranging from almost nothing, uh, but some, to above market. Right. So the the issue, I think, is not how you define it, but what impact is, and that's what we're really going to talk about. So I want to I want to define 
several categories of investors. First, they're socially neutral investors. And they're peop that doesn't mean that their investments don't have consequences. It means that the only thing they care about is uh, market returns. They care about financial returns. And if you doubt whether they're social neutral investors, those of you who are old enough to have retirement funds, think about how your retirement funds are managed, most of them, not all. So they're socially neutral investors. And then they're impact investors. And impact investors is socially motivated. The impact investor wants to have some social impact. And among that category of, so of socially motivated investors, they're non-concessionary. That is, they want to have it all. They want to have good financial returns, and they want to have social impact. And then they are their concessionary investors. They're willing to make some trade-off in financial return in order to have social impact. Um, I'm not going to linger on this slide. The, the real point here is that different, different impact investors may have different goals, and there's really a broad range of goals. Uh, my guess is because of, of CSIS in your presence here, many of you are interested in development goals, but that's just one, one possible set of goals one might have. So basically, here's how it works. The, the ecosystem, kind of the structure of impact investing, there's a financial investment in a social enterprise for the benefit of beneficiaries. And there may be, we'll talk a bit about this later, non-monetary benefits as well. And then because it is an investment, uh, there is at least the expectation or hope that uh, some, something gets returned to the investor. Impact, because what I want to talk about is not the definition, but what impact is. Impact means making a difference and that depends on the counterfactual, right? The counterfactual is what would have happened if you hadn't done something. So we're going to talk about three kinds of impact. An enterprise uh, has impact if it produces something of value that wouldn't have happened otherwise. And an investor or somebody making non-monetary contributions uh, to the process has impact if it increases the quality or quantity uh, of the investee organization's output beyond what would have otherwise occurred. So I'm going to talk first of all about enterprise impact, and then about investment impact, and then non-monetary impact. Enterprise impact is, is you, everybody's familiar with that, uh, so I'm going to go over it quickly. Non-monetary impact is pretty simple. Investment impact is where I think the most interesting uh, issues arise. The point of this slide is really that without enterprise impact, nothing makes any difference. That is, no matter how smart an investor you are, no matter how much elbow grease you put into non-monetary inputs, unless the enterprise itself has impact, it's all for naught. So anybody recognize this almost iconic picture of an enterprise? Hus Power, right. Somebody mentioned Hus Power. Right. So Hus Power is a, a Indian enterprise that uses rice husks to make power uh, in, in small communities that are off the grid. So how does, how does an enterprise have impact? One is it could produce a product like power uh, um, that's needed for its customers and beneficiaries. It could have operational impact, for example. It creates jobs. That is the very operation of the organization is valuable, or it might have sector impact, something which uh, a really terrific article uh, by uh, Matt Bannock and, and uh, Paula Goldman at, at Omidyar called Priming the Pump talks about Omidyar's support for entire sectors or fields. So these are three kinds of enterprise impact, with product that impact kind of being paradigmatic, right? It produces something of value, whether it's health or energy or clean water or what have you. So what are the criteria for an enterprise having impact? The first question is, did the enterprise produce its intended output? But that's not enough, right? That's, that's important. But the next question is, did the output actually contribute to the intended outcome? So and, you, know, you can have a company like A through Z, which makes malaria bed nets. They produce the output, the bed nets, but the question remains, do the malaria bed nets actually reduce malaria? A, a much harder question to answer. The, the counterfactual is, it would have happened anyway. right? So you distribute the bed nets, but this was a, a, a period of drought 
uh, or something else happened to deal with the malaria otherwise. So um, right now, the state of philanthropic evaluation is pretty bad. Uh, and the state of evaluating impact investments is even worse. I, I think these are probably, this is great inflation, maybe. Uh, the, the, the IRIS, and IRIS, which is a, a, you know, a system, a, a trying to unify um, <clears throat> a number of outputs uh, of companies, is actually played a very important role in creating some standards in the area. And it works, on, it works though, not on the ultimate outcome, but really on outputs. And GEARS is a rating system largely based on ours. They're, they're working to improve it. So, uh, and an important question here, maybe not for you, but for, for an organization like B-Lab, which runs GEARS, is, is there enough donor demand? Do donors really care enough about impact to support developing this further? I'll skip that. Okay, so enterprise impact, basically, if you've ever thought about the impact of any nonprofit organization or any organization supported by governments, you're thinking about enterprise impact. And it, the concept is no different in impact investing than it is anywhere else. Is the enterprise making something valuable happen that otherwise wouldn't have happened? Investment impact is where it gets interesting. So the question, let me come back to my, my three categories of investors. They're, they're socially neutral as one category, and then they're socially motivated. Uh, this concessionary investor finds it kind of painful. Uh, the concession he's making, the non-concessionary investment gets it all. And the question I want to focus on is, when does uh, a socially motivated investment, which is what impact investments are, when does it have impact? And there are two possibilities. One is it provides capital that the enterprise wouldn't otherwise have, and it reduce, or it reduces the cost of capital beyond what it would uh, otherwise get. So assuming that the enterprise has a absorptive capacity to use the money wisely, then a grant almost has impact, or almost has uh, investor impact, because by hypothesis, ordinary investors would not make grants, because grants are unrecoverable donations, right? And so I, we, this is Andrew Carnegie. I'm, uh, since you failed the Hus Power question, I'm not going to ask you to identify Andrew Carnegie. Uh, but the, you know, that, that's easy. Again, it's, it's not necessarily easy because grants can screw things up, right? If you make a grant uh, in a situation where you'd much, much better have competitive markets, the grant can actually mess up markets. But assuming, assuming the enterprise can usefully uh, can make, can make use of the funds, grants are great. So the question is, in concessionary investments, concessionary investments also almost always have, again, if it's a wise investment, they have investment impact because by hypothesis, an ordinary market, an ordinary commercial investor would not make uh, concessionary investments. Anybody recognize this iconic picture? Yes, several people have nodded. So this is 1298. 1298 uh, ambulance, you know, apparently all the numbers up to this were taken in India, so you couldn't have 911. Uh, and this is an organization, I think, supported initially by Acumen Fund that provides uh, ambulance service to the very poor. So here's a case where the investor takes a higher risk than the market would or takes lower returns. In this case, probably, probably both. The interesting question is when can a non-concessionary investment, that is an investment that expects market returns, risk-adjusted market returns are better, when can it have impact? So I'm going to raise and dismiss, although you may want to come back to it in the discussion, that, that the possibility of having uh, impact in public markets. Uh, let me put it this way. I think, suppose I think that AT&T has really valuable impact because it provides telecommunications and jobs. So I put all my retirement funds into AT&T. Will that actually help AT&T increase uh, its services? And the answer is no. Absent some huge, massive movement of funds or a movement uh, in public markets, any group of investors is not going to have any effect. So where can it have an effect? I think in imperfect markets, where there are market frictions, 
And I think the, the classic case where it can have an effect is where uh, there's imperfect information. To use a term that I, I learned when I audited a class by a fellow named David Chen who runs an impact investing fund, he says, I see something that you don't see. In many respects, it's the same, the same quality that allows a good venture capitalist uh, to make an investment that other people don't see. Right? The investor has special information. Um, and, you know, but there's the danger, of course, that people claim that non-concessionary investments are having impact. I, I, by this slide, I don't mean to suggest that, that clean tech is never a impact investment. But when you have a huge fad, and when people investing in clean tech are investing alongside of Kleiner Perkins and major venture capitalists who have no uh, socially, social motivations, you wonder whether they're really having impact. And then finally, non-monetary impact, which is, uh, which is you know, conceptually much easier. So non there are all sorts of ways in which uh, people in the field uh, of impact investing can help. One is, this is, I mentioned Omidyar before, improving the enabling environment, creating property rights, uh, reducing corruption, uh, facilitating markets. Uh, Fund managers, impact investing fund managers, find opportunities. That's the I see something that you don't see. And um, hopefully, they make it available so that many people can see it. Uh, fund managers also aggregate capital. I mean, you, most of us who are interested in impact investing don't want to go out and find the deals ourselves. So, you know, so we go to grassroots business fund and have them do it. Uh, they provide TA, uh, technical assistance, to um, the organizations. And here's something really important. What's the, what the hope of every impact investor is that at some point, the enterprise or sector in which he or she's investing no longer needs impact investing, right? They are the booster rockets that get this into, into orbit, and then it just becomes commercially uh, the markets become attractive to commercial investors. So gaining socially neutral investors is sort of one of the things that, that can really facilitate impact investing making its difference. And then finally, another non-monetary benefit is protecting the social mission. The, the story of microfinance is one in which, um, as microfinance in some areas becomes, became uh, a commercial success, there were temptations uh, by the organizations to lose the social mission, to charge higher rates than necessary, or to use uh, unpleasant ways of, of recovering the loans, or, or to begin creaming. And so one role that, for example, investors can play on the board of, a, uh, of an organization is to protect its mission even as it attracts more commercial investors. So I'll stop there and turn it over to my fellow panelists. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you very much. I'm going to ask uh, I'm going to ask Harold Rosen to speak first, only because I know you you've commented on the on the paper. So Harold, I'm going to ask you to to respond and also to provide your your comments on the on the topic of impact investing. Okay. Thanks, Dan, and um, thanks to all of you for giving me the chance to um, address and share some ideas and hear what you think. It's uh, encouraging to see so many former colleagues or present colleagues and investees of ours here in the audience. So it uh, makes me feel like something went right, that many of you are still in business or even doing well. So, And there's a lesson there somewhere. So, um, and Dan did to tell me that I could be myself today, which is a dangerous thing to say, but um, I can be a little frank, so I will. So anyway, I was with the IFC for 30 years. I was the small business guy. I did a lot of regular investing work. <clears throat> I ran a lot of their technical assistance and early microfinance and SME activities, really in IFC and the World Bank. So we did a lot, and a lot of the people in the room who I just referred to were among the group that they used to call Harold Stray Cats. I always love telling that story that uh, I won't name any, but some who have grown quite big were at you know, 10, 15 years ago, that image of a little kid that finds a stray cat on the street that's terribly unhealthy looking but interesting and brings it into his mother and says, Mom, can I keep it? I see some of my friends cringing in the front. They said, uh-oh, he's going to be himself. One of the pleasures of my life is I'm actually a stray cat to all the people who've invested in us now. And after a spinoff, I am probably the scariest thing that most of our main investors have ever done. 
And in a way, I say, um, so why, one part of that kind of galls me, because I feel like I know how to invest. And Agnes, who used to work with me, uh, we had a pretty good team, I would call first world investment quality. But then I'm treated through, let's say, specialized initiatives, or I'm basically too scary for most of the organizations that invested in us. Sorry, Mitchell. Um, but and if Mitchell wasn't there, OPIC wouldn't have done it with us either. So uh, there's something there, which is uh, breaking a new mold. Now, microfinance is an absolutely mainstream asset class in the DFIs. I would love to see impact investment get there in less than the 12 or 15 years it took us in the DFI community. I think we can do that. Anyway, GBF, to make a very long story short, is a um, impact investing fund. We were spawned inside the IFC and largely funded by them and Omidyar and a few others. We spun out five years ago and had a phase where we were all grant funded, like many others in the field. Two years ago, we split that into a nonprofit, which is still grant funded. We all work for the nonprofit. We're the management company. We also have an investment in the fund. Uh, so it's a for-profit fund alongside of the nonprofit, and there's a reason, and it relates to some of what Dan was ta or Paul was talking about. We are two years into a five-year booking period of what's really a 10-year closed-end fund. It's 49 million dollars, which includes OPIC, DEG, FMO, Calvert, Deutsche Bank, 30 private investors, and an equity investment by the nonprofit. Sorry, I'm running through a lot of ground. Uh, there's another 11 million, which is grants from the nonprofit that we use to build the organizations into which we invest. That's a critical part of the equation. And as Agnes knows, we, I was prepared to actually call this off and not do it if we couldn't raise enough of that money. Because as I always say, the world does not need another fund. They need the enterprises into which all the funds out there can invest. And by the way, one of the guys who runs our technical assistance is sitting there modestly and exhausted. We've just done our mid-year technical assistance review, Eric Meissner. Uh, is a great guy, and we've. Um, if any of you want to know what the dirty underside of doing small ticket BA or business advisory services to build these kind of businesses, Eric is one of the world's walking experts. So uh, the, we have this five-year booking period. We're learning a lot. Uh, we. What's really special about us is that we, this business of BAS, which I think we're doing in a very serious, hands-on way. We're big on social impact. We keep a very careful track to make sure we're not just being like everyone else, but that we're reaching a lot of poor people in a sustainable way. We're building good businesses that in turn have big impacts. Uh, we're also, because we have this luxury of five years of money, I have this uh, occasion I can be myself sort of and speak out about some of the, what I see in the field. And I think uh, with things like Paul's article does a great job of laying out potential issues. Uh, some of the things we've learned that relate to Paul's article that I also commented on, um, I don't know if my response is actually going to cross the bar and make it into the journal, but I, I'm told it might. So if, I'm also working on a blog that's even more direct, so some of you may enjoy that. Uh, so one of the things we've learned is that the difficulty factor of building these businesses into anything approaching a commercially investable transaction is way harder than people make out, especially if you care about real impact. The idea of making anything approaching a market-based return, whatever that means in this field, it just doesn't happen except on deals. You know, we keep hearing about the sell tells, and if you take a few of these deals that made all those private equity funds, even the quote regular funds didn't make anything like. I think I say that in the response to Paul's article. I know what all the DFIs make on their funds, and to put it mildly, it's a lot less than what the stated expectations are, and. My fundraise, as Agnes used to always cringe walking into a fundraise meeting with me, uh, I would go, walk in and first start by saying, you know, if, you're, if I do a really good job and you all are lucky, I'll get a high single, low double digit return. So half the room gets up and runs out as fast as they can. And then I say, and I need grant money to build the enterprises and make sure we're sticking to heart. Before I finish that, another half of who's left is, so we're left with a small, the front row is filled, and that's who ended up being in our fund. So I'm delighted with that. We have a group that gets it, or at least bits of big organizations that get it, and that's the fun. If I can help Mitchell build OPIC into a nimble sort of impact investing shop or part of it, I would love that. Uh, one of the things we're doing now is just trying to keep our head down and build a track record. We've booked 20 million, or committed 20 million out of the 50 million in the first five years. <clears throat> you know, so far so good. We've got a seven, and actually an eight percent cash on cash yield. We every payments come in on time, which is very hard in this. Uh, we have no specific losses, and some of these are four and five years old, so they're starting to mean something. 
uh, Mitchell made good and sure on the fundraise that this was real investment and she wasn't going to also have egg over her face in the first year or two. So I, I feel like, and my, and my board also says, please, Harold, don't do the conference circuit. Don't, you know, powder your nose, as they put it. Build your track record and then others will come if, when you get to a new round. And that's what we're doing. We're trying hard to uh, share our lessons right now. I don't want to start sharing things that we haven't proved, but I think small ticket, <clears throat> closely monitored business advisory services is one thing I think we're getting good at. <clears throat> and I'd love to be able to do like case studies with some of the leading business schools or sharing. I'm not much of a knowledge person myself, but I think we're learning a lot. So that's something I think we could do and we're sort of gearing up for what to do with all the stuff Eric and his team is learning. <laughs> Uh, I think speaking out and just doing what I'm doing now, but in a select you know, small set of audiences is the best way I can start you know, telling this story because, as I always say, in this field, everyone's fundraising all the time. So it's really hard to be frank and about challenges and difficulties, which also relates to this lack of transparency that everyone, I don't want to say everyone, a lot of people pretend or like to think they're making a higher return than they are. And it's easy in this field to kick the can down the road, restructure an investment, you know, put some BAS money in, and you've got a spotless portfolio. We've got to make sure that we actually are doing good investment work, and we can share the lessons of how we do that. Um, and then the other thing I call it is just cutting through the fog, because there is so much well-intended enthusiasm in this field. It's very difficult to see so the, the transparency, like how have all of the grand funded, and I was one until recently, so I'm not criticizing, how do all of the grand funded investors in this impact field, or investors who don't really need to get their money back, of <clears throat> what, how are they doing? Uh, I can't talk about them, but one thing with us is as soon as someone misses a payment, it is immediately apparent in our fund. And I figure that's a high, I know why others don't do it, because if you don't get a good return, you're out of business, which is kind of the way we wanted it. I don't want to scare Eric and my other employees here, but uh, you know, we, I, I don't crow too much about this because we haven't proven it yet. But in another year or two, we'll have a meaningful enough track record that when, as we're starting to run out of money in this fund, I hope some of our existing private investors or some of the existing agencies will say, yeah, not a great return, but good enough that that crosses the bar and we'll do some more. Um, so, and let me just stop there. Thank you, Harold. Probably gone longer. And anyway, so Dan, thanks for the chance and uh, good luck. Thank you. Thanks. The uh, I'm going to ask John Simon to to, to follow on. Uh, we were just we you know Harold I think did a very good job of talking about okay what does this look like operationally. John, I think you spend a lot of time helping to find opportunities and and bring the various players together in your in your current life, but also in your past life. You had to make policy decisions at, at OPIC about whether or not. Could you talk a little bit about from wearing that hat, your past life at, at OPIC, and also your, your current life at, at, at Total Impact? Sure, and thank you, Dan, for pulling this together. Thank you, Paul, for an excellent paper. I think it's a real contribution to some of the major issues that we struggle with in the impact investing community. I would like to note that I think Harold's board is very wise to admonish him against having too much uh, uh, conference circuit activity versus investing activity. I think you know we in the impact investment sector love metrics. and. Um, one metric we really need to, to get is the number of words per dollar invested. I think our words per dollar invested is a very high, is unreasonably high, and we really need to bring that down. Uh, and, and it's interesting, you spend a lot of time at uh, various events um, discussing these very metaphysical, epistemological questions, like you know, what is impact? Uh, what is an asset class? Or that's one of my favorites. Um, what is the market rate return? Uh, and I think we, we waste a lot of time doing that instead of getting on with the work that Harold does of, all right, let's find some good deals that people can look at and say, yeah, that's a real impact there, and um, that's worth investing in. And the return I get, who knows if it's above or below market. I mean, this day and age where, uh, you know, your 10-year treasury is below, I guess it used to be below 2%, now it's below 3%, but still pretty, pretty low. You know, if you, if you can beat that, that's not so bad if you're trying, trying to manage your portfolio. And obviously some other folks are, are looking to beat it more. I would make a point about, you know, stated returns never being what, they, what they're anticipated on. I don't think when I was at the Overseas Private Investment Corporation or in my current life I've ever seen a fund, uh, with the exception I think of yours, Harold, that promised a return of below 20%. And we get these reports from uh, uh, the service that tells us what the, uh, you know, different vintage year funds returns actually are. And I don't think I've ever seen one that showed the top quartile being above 20%. So somehow there's a little, 
you know, dichotomy there between what people say and what they can deliver. And I think there's an interesting paradox that uh, Paul's presented in his paper. Uh, maybe we can call it the breast paradox. Uh, I mean, Paul posits that if you're looking for a market rate return, well, you can only have impact if you're doing something that a, cons uh, a, a socially neutral investor uh, wouldn't otherwise do. And if you're looking for a mar market rate return, well, that's what a socially neutral investor is looking for. So how is it that you can do something um, that uh, can achieve scale? Because that's really where you only get impact. I mean, if we fund a lot of basket weaving cooperatives, that's only going to do so much. We only can really get impact if we achieve scale. To get scale, we have to track non-concessionary funding. But according to Paul, if we attract non-concessionary funding, we're really not making any other impact than otherwise would be there. And I think the way that you resolve this paradox, I mean, one way is the one that Paul said, which is uh, that you have investors who can find both the diamonds in the rough, both the impact and the return that other people can't see. And uh, there are um, maybe some magical type people who can do that. But I think most real people have a tough time uh, making that work. But there is another way. I mean, Paul actually put up five ways. But the one that I think is most interesting is the fifth, which is there are a lot of sectors and geographies uh, and um, business models that at the outset are not going to be the types of things that, that you could attract commercial capital to. If you're going into a post-conflict uh, situation, you know, there's not a lot of, you know, the, the, uh, uh, a few folks have said, I, this quote's been attributed to many, many people. Uh, I, I remember uh, Paul O'Neill used to say, this former Treasury Secretary, capital's a coward. You know, capital doesn't go to places where there's undue risk. Um, but capital is required in a post-conflict situation, in a, in, in a frontier market, in a uh, sector such as clean water or primary health care, which typically uh, has not been money producing in m many parts of the world. And um, what the impact investor does is the impact investor said, all right, I will fund that. I'm not worried so much about whether I get, you know, 5% or 10% or 15%. I will want to know that that business is going to succeed. Because if the business fails, then my impact, as Paul said, is zero. I've done nothing. I would have been better off giving my money away. Uh, but I do expect if that model is going to ultimately achieve um, a real impact, an impact that's significant beyond the village or the, or, the, or the country in which it is, I do want to know that ultimately it's going to be commercially sustainable. Will my return be that commercial return? Well, depending on how good a negotiator are and depending on how you structure the investment, maybe, maybe not. But ultimately, I want to believe that I'm investing in something that is the type of thing that will attract uh, uh, um, uh, commercially oriented investors, because that's the way you're going to get from the village to the country, from the country to the <coughs> continent, from the continent to the world. And the question I think you're posing, Dan, is all right, how do we hit that inflection point? How do we, I mean, impact investing exists. It's existed for, for years. OPIC has always done some amount of impact investing, depending on how you count. Mirza Jahani from the Aga Khan Development Network is here. Aga Khan uh, Development Network has been doing some sort of impact investing. Uh, for years, and actually has done a pretty good job of finding those things that are both high impact and, and, and relatively high, high, high returning. Um, so it's always been out there, but to get to a point where it justifies all the work that people like myself and Howard, Harold and Agnes are putting into this, I think you have to be able to imagine an industry that's beyond sort of little stovepipes and pockets of money and can really meet, reach mainstream capital. And to do that, I think there are a few elements that have to happen. First and foremost, you need transparency on what's really occurring. And that's why, to some extent, the word to action ratio is not just, bad, not just not good, it's actually bad. Because to the extent that we set um, false expectations and then fail to achieve those, we will scare away a lot of the mainstream capital that ultimately will, will hopefully drive a, um, the scaling up of the types of enterprises that we're, that we're, that we're, try, we're, we're trying to do. Um, the, the, the second piece, I think, that has to be out there is the ability to pull the various different pots of money together out of their very stovepipes, and we talked a little bit about that lunch, into vehicles that can utilize the, um, uh, uh, the concessions that certain grantors and donors are willing to give to make the investments more attractive for the, for the, um, for the folks who are farther up the spectrum closer to the, to the commercial type investor. Uh, and the last point I'd make um, is the amazing thing that we see. So we're in the business of helping businesses navigate the impact investment world and attract impact investment capital. And on a 
good week, we probably see about 10 uh, enterprises that, that come in our doors looking for us to help them. Uh, so, you know, our little company sees about 500 enterprises a year. I go and I talk to Harold, and I talk to Harold's peers, and I talk to others, and they say, where are the businesses? Where are the enterprises that we can invest in? We're looking for enterprises that meet certain criteria, and we can't find them out there. And yet over here, there are hundreds in our little case, thousands, I wager tens of thousands. The problem is, there's a real challenge to turn the th folks that come into our door into something that Harold is willing to look at. Um, and to bridge that challenge, you need to put a lot of work in, in terms of upgrading the management system, in terms of making the uh, 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 financials more presentable, in terms of sometimes refining the business model so it's a bit more focused, a bit more economical, and a bit more in line with the type of ramp up that an impact investor is looking to see. And that, that effort uh, you know, requires effort. And so I think supporting the folks in the world, and this is a bit self-serving, but who do that type of work is an essential to creating the connective tissue that can help this, this, this market progress. So thank you. Thanks, John. Agnes, you've worn several different hats. You were at IFC, uh, and then you went with Harold to the Grassroots Business Fund, and so um, have had your fingers, fingers in these issues for a long time, and now have gone over to USAID to, to help think about these issues from, a, from the U.S. government's perspective. Can you talk a little bit about, A, reflect on what you heard from Paul, what you heard from the other panelists, uh, more broadly about the sector, and then talk a little bit about what the U.S. government is doing and, and what you're doing in your, in your current job. First of all, thank you, Dan, for, uh, for this invitation. It's great to really see a lot of familiar faces and to kind of reconnect a little bit with the impact investing world. Um, I have to say that um, I think Paul's paper is really coming at a right time because um, in my past career, the issues that Paul raises, Harold and I discussed constantly. I think um, that it brings to bear a lot of um, advice for people who want to go into impact investing, but also uh, raises a lot of questions that I think haven't been answered. Um, I am now part of a new group, well, it's not so new anymore, at USAID called the Private Capital Group for Africa. And I think uh, this impact investing discussion is timely because USAID for the last few years, including with my group, has been really trying to recognize that private investment is key to economic growth and has been trying to figure out how do we align our interests with investors. So how do we align the developmental goals with what the investors are also seeking in the same markets and together really have the catalytic effect that we need at scale in countries, especially for me in Africa. Uh, we do this um, through various mechanisms that we do have available. We guarantee debt into funds. We most recently participated as an LP in a fund, an SME fund in Pakistan, which was the first time that USAID has ever done that. Uh, so we're trying to figure out how do we help investors, how do we share risk with them in order to catalyze capital into developmentally important sectors. So I think the impact investing conversation, especially about transparency and measurement, is incredibly important. Because if uh, governmental institutions such as USAID are expected to continue really supporting that kind of conversation and those kinds of investments, we need to have the ultimate transparency, we need to have the ultimate um, really monitoring of what's really happening, because we are really spending taxpayer dollars, so we're spending your dollars. Um, therefore, it's not just a reputational risk for us. We're really, for us to be in, invest, sorry, responsible investors in this space, we really, really need to have the ultimate transparency, which I think is what this conversation is trying to, trying to start and trying to continue. Um, so I really welcome that. Okay, so let me put this to the panel and then I'm going to open it up to the group. But uh, if I think about the microfinance sector, the U.S. government played a critical role in actually creating the microfinance sector 30 years ago. And it, it's moved into a, many people I think are familiar with the fact that it's moved into, a, uh, there's a segment of the microfinance world that's not, not commercial, but there is a, now a sector that is commercial, and I think it's been a result of the significant efforts of USAID. I'd say USAID has historically been the largest grant maker to 
and the U.S. government has been the largest grant maker to the microfinance sector. There's an earmark in the Congress for microfinance, or, and then um, and then IFC. The shorthand always was is the largest commercial investor in the microfinance sector. And I think Harold, I think you had something to do with, as you were mentioning earlier, that I think you brought the first uh, deals, uh, microfinance deals, to IFC at the time when it wasn't considered something cool. It was considered, I guess, as you termed it, a stray cat. And so there were a series of things taken by government. And there have been, a, I know, a number of things the Obama administration has done. They've made some investments in measurement and uh, looking at helping to try and bring about some of these, these metrics. Um, there's some work, uh, not necessarily for impact investors in terms of business advisory services, something that, that Harold alluded to um, in terms of various forms of technical assistance, then the various uh, initiatives such as the ones that Agnes is involved with, but also the work of Development Credit Authority and certain parts of, of, of OPIC and what they're doing, as well as some, some specific opportunities at the Millennium Challenge Corporation. There have been a series of things that that have been done. But let me, the question I want to put to this group, and I want to start with the, the, the folks who are responding to Paul's work, mainly because they're more familiar with sort of the Washington conversation, is, is, okay, what should the U.S. government be doing? I think, John, you alluded to it a little bit, and it was based on our conversation at lunch. So, John, let me start with you, and then we'll just go down the, down the row here. What should the U.S. government be doing more of to bring about uh, the, the growth of this sector? Yeah, so I think there's certain things that are naturally in the sphere of the public sphere and certain things that really, I think, are better left to the industry and the private sector players. So I think transparently, transparency is fundamentally important. I would not want to put public mandates on for transparency. Um, I think the industry needs to be better at pulling together its ways of bec becoming more transparent. Um, and I think that that, that's, that is essential to the growth of this, of this sector and essential to the right growth of this sector. But I'd be wary about you know, having that be a, a, a public activity. One thing that has been done, USAID, I think, has funded some of the activity in IRS and GEARS, and I think that's all well and good. But I would be wary of, of, of mandates in, in that area. The one thing that we did talk about at lunch that I think is critical is there, you know, there are all these public programs that are critical components of, at least in the international sphere, impact investments. I mean, Harold made the point that his largest investor is OPIC. Of the you know, dozen or so deals that we've closed recently or are coming to closure, um, DFIs are a part of about 60% of those, so you know, uh, uh, seven or eight of those. Um, and, and, and these public pots of money are, uh, are right now, they're the, you know, you, you, when you think about the, the, the investors who are active in impact investing, you have angel investors, uh, folks like the members of the Tonic Group out in the West Coast, they deploy a few hundred thousand to a million per deal, not a whole lot. You have foundations. Uh, sometimes they can deploy a large amount of money, but usually it's relatively small. Um, uh, you have some of the impact funds, like Harold's Fund, which I think is one of the bigger sort of sources of capital, the, the, the uh, bamboos, the GBFs, the acumens of the world. Uh, and then you have the DFIs, which by and large are probably an order of magnitude bigger than almost any of those, those others. And so the DFIs, I think, are an essential component, and we have a very fragmented DFI world here in the U.S. It's less fragmented in other countries. I think bringing, having a development finance bank of the U.S., which is something my former colleagues at CGD have advocated for, I think would be a great way to bring a lot of the different resources that we have to bear uh, together. Uh, and then the last point is, you know, I think you have to figure out how to take that big world of, you know, opportunities and, and, and um, encourage a, a process to, to, to help them get to be uh, investable. And I think things like the business, uh, the challenge funds that the UK has done, uh, we've had a few of our deals get uh, African Enterprise Challenge Fund grants that have been essential to making them work. Uh, things like supporting, you know, business development services uh, that can help companies um, get to the point where they have clean financials and a clear business plan and a clear uh, ramp up schedule that the investors are looking, looking to see. Things like that, I think, are, are uh, essential. There's, there's one last component that I should raise, but it's very much in flux now, which is what the regulatory environment is. So when we went into this world, um, we had to get registered as a uh, broker dealer. 
Uh, we have to, you know, make sure you that have to yes, take a series seven. We had to take a series seventy nine and a sixty three, and probably I should at some point take a twenty three. Um, it's 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 uh, it's 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 no small thing, um, and it's no small lack of expense. I would argue it would be nice to get a break on that from impact investing. Of course, in a post two thousand eight world, that was almost impossible. But now with the Jobs Act, we have crowdfunding. And who knows where that's going to lead us in terms of open doors. I could easily see this, the, the, the pendulum swinging a little bit too far in the other way. And I think one big scandal of a bunch of folks being defrauded for a so-called do-good investment could be really, really bad. So I do think that I do think that's an area that requires, requires a little bit of look at, looking at. I am concerned that, you could, that too much in either direction is a negative. Okay, Harold, if you, uh, what, what should the U.S. government be doing? What should the DFI sector be doing? Where if you take the analogy of the venture capital industry or let's say how Silicon Valley became the world's hotspot for entrepreneurship, what happens? And there's a reason I'm saying this towards answering Dan's question. Uh, a couple of guys in college uh, start up something in their garage and within half a generation they can be billionaires because there's an ecosystem. There's help, there's entrepreneurs who will bring their business savvy with them to the table and help the guy grow. And if he needs a CFO, he'll get, he'll get it all of those things. So the US government could play a role in simulating at least the pieces of that in certain tough markets where we know that's not going to work. There's reasons in Tanzania why someone just as smart as the Google guys would have not a chance in hell of getting the right inputs together. So the government could do this. Uh, if you look at how much money gets spent by the big agencies in a place like Tanzania on business development services or technical assistance, it's mammoth. It is way more than they can observe. And the track record shows what happens when you spend too much money for something that's hard and granular. So I always say take 3% of what gets thrown away on bad technical assistance in any of those markets and say, that's earmark it. And the US government could do this. I don't want to speak for Agnes's agency, but uh, it would be a rounding error, given the amounts you could sensibly move, to take bits of even just one big government's programs and say, okay, a little bit of vouchers for BAS or technical assistance, uh, a little bit of under tranche so that we can do like, in microfinance, this happens galore, under tranches and different types of soft capital to make the top tranches reasonably commercial. That could happen. And I think sometimes the big agencies, I'll just talk about the one I was with, you get yourself scared into thinking that your governance and the, uh, environment and your theological tenets won't let you do this. Like, why would the World Bank soft loan window ever think about putting an under tranche below private investors, just like the US government did for SBIC in the late 70s with huge success? That sort of thing. Um, I, I heard what um, I think John was saying about there is, a, there is a transformational element. It's not a shortage of capital, I think. There's plenty of capital, more than you could ever move. It is prying loose pieces of the right kinds of things at the right time. Even for funds, much less individual businesses, that's hard. Uh, I think the problem is we often go at it, those who haven't like got all the bruises that I have from trying to change big organizations, uh, can easily look at such an institution and say, hmm, OPIC ought to, or, or pick on the World, the World Bank or any, ought to be able to do this. The problem is big institutions, especially when they get big and, quote, successful, don't change like this. The best you're going to do is take little pieces of them and say, and the U.S. could do this because we are, you, we are the biggest shareholder in most of these organizations in question, even if it's not the U.S. government. Say, look, enough. Let's take a half of 1% of what Ida spends in a year. That's the soft loan window of the World Bank. And try that uh, under some structure like what the challenge funds did in DFID. DFID, I always say, is those challenge funds were probably the best story I've ever seen of cutting through the morass, getting at some usable money out of a complicated environment. The U.S. government could do that. So if you took the three or four pieces of the puzzle and even just a region like Africa, that the U.S. government could do. And I think we tend to make the mistake of let's start with a clean slate, which you never have. And you, all, you never throw away the theological entrapments and the bureaucratic things that come out of public or charitable agencies. The best you're going to do is uh, say, let's take a little piece of this and that, put it together. The U.S. government could do that, uh, just saying, OK, we're going to try a little bit of IDA, a little bit of AID. Uh, they occasionally do this in pieces. The problem is one thing at a time almost never works. You know, in, in other words, one of these enterprises we work with, and we've got 20 of them now, they're pretty funky. You know, they're not size differentiated. They're big, a lot of them, often the biggest companies in their markets. And because of that, they are facing business challenges that they're just not equipped to deal with. Even if angel investors 
I hate to say this, but from Silicon Valley, there is that kind of capital. There are groups that crowdsource capital. Some of my investors are involved in that too, and I know a lot about this. The problem is those are all, I don't want to say throwaways, but they're done as do good or I have this in my charity budget, so I'll, even though I'm a businessman, I'll put a little money into it. And along with that does not come the business smarts. Way more important than the money that angel investor would put in would be the, so how could you de-risk or bring local business people from Africa into these deals so that you've got some local smarts? That's one of the things we're still exposed with. So just to close on what we're thinking, if we do get that far and our track record justifies keeping going or getting bigger after this round, I'm pretty committed that we're going to try to figure out a way to get local investors with us in regional funds or something. Because right now our big exposure is we're a global fund that's investing in a wide range of geographies. There's a reason for that because we try to stay selective, so we need a wide funnel. But it's probably not sustainable in that we don't have good, smart, local business sense in the deals. And that's another one that it would take very little money to de-risk that or to make it interesting. Uh, so that's a long-winded answer. I think the US government or any big government could do m many of the pieces of that puzzle. Agnes, do you want to take that question? Yeah, I, maybe I shouldn't, given yeah, <laughs> the government could, payroll. May, yes. But let me just tell you a few things about uh, I, I do have some thoughts about it, yes. mainly because that's actually what we're trying to do. Um, so first, um, I think we could do a couple of things better as USAID, and I won't speak for the other agencies. First, I think we can and we need to build more skills to interact with investors, starting with really teaching uh, all the USAID staff in the field the language of investing, the expectations, and the behavior of investors. I think just uh, developing a further understanding of that is key to the US government really being to being part of the conversation in the sector. Uh, number two, we can be more flexible. Uh, we're really working on that. We are trying to, um, to not be as country specific as sometimes uh, we were in the past, where I think, I mean, I think there's an argument to be country specific because I think the people who are actually doing the work in the field have the most knowledge about what's happening and they should be kind of the decision makers on what's, what's um, happening. And that's why a lot of the things that we do are very country specific, but I think we could, we could probably, as Harold said, take a percentage of, of some of the things that we do and try to make that money a little bit more flexible so that we can use it um, more rapidly. <clears throat> Uh, we can also probably work better with others, um, meaning that uh, not just with other DFIs, but really with the other government agencies. And I think uh, the recent uh, launch of Power Africa Initiative is trying to address that, where we have formed an interagency transactions team, where all the agencies involved in energy work um, within the U.S. government USAID, MCC, Exim, OPEC, and others are really sitting at the table together and looking at um, joint projects and joint investments. And uh, I think most importantly, and we're doing some of that as well already, is we can create a feedback loop with the private sector. I think that developing this kind of dialogue where we hear from the private sector that's involved in the field, in the sectors that we're trying to assist, what's working and what's not working would really help us uh, design better programs that are much more catalytic towards investment than maybe they have been in the past. Thanks, Agnes. I'm going to, uh, I see a whole slew of people I want to call on and I, who's got a microphone is Maggie, you have a microphone, but why don't you, if you would, sir, come up. I want to call on my friend Mitchell from, from OPEC. If you're looking at me to, and first I'm going to call on, I want to call, I'm going to call on Mitchell. I want to hear from Mirza. I want to hear from Sherry Barnback. I want to hear from, uh, my friend Bruce, and I want to hear from Mildred. So maybe I'll, I'm not going to ask Mitchell to speak first since she's with the U.S. government. I'll give her a chance to collect her thoughts. Well, I'm going to ask Mirza to speak first. So why don't you come up and put Mirza on the spot? Then we're going to open up to others. But I know there's a lot of brain trust right here in this front row, and then there's a lot of thoughtful people beyond that. And we'll get to a lot of people, I promise. Uh, thank you very much, Dan. I know next time when to where to sit in the room. Yes, uh, when exactly. I come to one of your functions. Um, I think the one thing that uh, we've learned at the Aga Khan Development Network is the uh, revolves around the issue of risk, which some of you have alluded to but have not really um, uh, been specific on. And I do feel that when we look at risk-adjusted uh, returns, clearly the equation is around both the returns as well as the risks. 
And if you had asked me what I think governments around the world should do, is they ought to focus on the area of risk and how does that risk come down for investors over time. And certainly in the interactions that we are having with different varieties of investors, uh, it's always that the lower the risk that you can demonstrate, partly because of the track record that the Aga Khan network has, uh, the more willing they are to go down that line of uh, concessionary lending that we really do need to, uh, to, to break into. So that's the only point that comes immediately to mind. I, I think about your Excel spreadsheet for investments that the Aga Khan network makes, and there was a conversation with the IFC, and they had sort of a 15-year timeline or something like that, and I think for the Aga Khan network, it's something like 50 years, and then it sort of drops off beyond that, right? I mean, you take an extremely long view, beyond long view, it's sort of massively long view on things like uh, telecoms in Afghanistan or et, et cetera, yeah. And so traditionally what we've done is that His Highness the Aga Khan himself has taken on that risk. And the question increasingly for us is, if other people come in and share in that risk, can we do a lot more? And so that's the question I would have for the panel as well. Okay. Okay, Mitchell, you, you do this for a day job. You think about, you've thought about these issues for a long time. And just and Mitchell Strauss from OPIC. I thought you were all just magnificent. And Paul, I don't know you well, but you were particularly magnificent. <laughs> Since I don't know you well, I thought I'd say that. I, I was happy to hear uh, Mirza mention the part about the risk. And the slide that you had was one of the, the new slides for me, where you showed that the risk being out of proportion was something that needed to be considered. And one of the things we're trying to work on at OPIC is utilizing our guarantee capacities, which lately mostly we use our guarantee capacities to raise other people's money and just <laughs> use that money in our transactions. But returning to the old-fashioned kind of guarantee where your, your mother and father guarantee the car dealer when you buy the car, uh, we're working now on setting up structures, hopefully aligning with other foundations and in the family, in the field, in the sector entities, and giving some guarantee capacity to that entity to help mitigate the risk of others. Similarly, we're looking at some people, some uh, not-for-profits who've you know, been much like politicians on this raise money, raise money, raise money, all the time getting on airplanes, to see whether we can't use our uh, willingness and trust in that entity's ability to function as an enterprise. And instead of lending directly or go, going to Wall Street to get other people's money, we'll take a little of the risk away from the social investor wannabe because it's that little toe into the water in, you know, on the West Coast. It looks like it's warm, but it's cold, and you get your toe in there. So we want to like take the water temperature to a nice temperate level and try and just use old tools in a new way. So thanks for letting me say something. Uh, please, Randall Kempner at Andy. Yeah, just, a, just a question um, to Paul. I hope we can get to this. I wanted you to justify your grades. Um, if I were going to do the grades, I would say we're still in elementary school and it should be needs improvement. Um, like S, S plus, or satisfactory, right. satisfactory plus. We're, we're not quite to letter grades yet, but uh, be interesting to know, you know, why a D in particular, and what concrete steps you would have to actually improve the grade. Fast, please test the Sherry's. Uh, Sherry, okay. you have a new life now, but you had a past life. You had several past lives that are relevant to this conversation. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm Shari Berenbach, and I'm the president and CEO of the African Development Foundation. And I have been very much involved in the impact investing field for quite some time. And if I have one comment to share uh, for Paul and perhaps, um, you know, all the panelists, is that what I find when you really look at the broad parameters in the impact investing space is that the old relationship between risk and return, that there was this notion of even a risk-adjusted return, I think is really something that no longer is tremendously uh, relevant. Because what you have, once you have uh, investors who are impact embracing, you have some who are willing to, who will be taking an investment where they're getting, uh, they're looking for a high return and they want low risk, and you have others who are willing to take a low return and high risk. 
Um, you know, the, the whole landscape really does start to move around. Um, and so it's important for us not to be too beholden to our prior financial training, because there doesn't necessarily have to be that relationship between risk and return. Okay, so we had some questions and some comments. I'm going to ask, Paul, why don't I ask you to respond first to the question about grades and grade inflation or pass-fail. Okay, I, you know, maybe the grades are generous. I mean, there, there are two barriers. <laughs> there, there, there are two barriers. By the way, somebody who says C plus and D are generous grades, that's, they're really tough. I mean, one barrier is the difficulty of measuring impact, right? It's, it's relatively, relatively easy to measure outputs. And again, I, I think one has to give credit to IRIS and to the GEARS rating system for trying to create some standardized uh, areas and criteria for outputs uh, across a fairly diverse area. When you move from outputs to outcomes, to whether you're actually having impact, uh, you're talking about doing randomized controlled trials uh, to see whether, whether something has had impact. And even when you've done randomized controlled trials in one area, uh, there was an interesting CGAT paper summarizing uh, RCTs involving impact, in, involving microfinance. You know, what looks at some level like the same strategy in one region doesn't work in another. So measuring impact is just really tough measuring enterprise impact especially. I think in some ways it's easier to know whether you're having additionality in an investment than you are whether the enterprise is working. The second barrier is do donors and investors care? There's a, an, an interesting study done uh, by a group called Hope Consulting about three years ago. And the question is how much research are donors and impact investors willing to make before they make a uh, grant or a concessionary investment. And the number, it gets, as you, as you Im increase the standard of research, uh, the number is not surprising, gets smaller. And only around 5% of donors are willing to do any serious research, kind of spend, I'm not sure what the metric is, but more than you know, a few minutes, figuring out whether the organization they're making a grant to uh, is, is doing anything very good. Well, an interesting question, I think, and this is a question in our field, which, which B-Lab, which, which does GEARS ratings, has to deal with is, you know, is there a financial, financially viable model for their digging deeper in, and, and increasing the grade from a D to a C? Uh, does anybody care, even if they do the work? I, I, I kind of, my hope is that if the information is provided in a, a useful form, uh, an easier to digest form, that more, do more donors and impact investors will use it. But I'm, uh, it remains to be seen. Do you want to comment on the other comments? Yeah, and, and I, think, I think you're right. I mean, modern finance theory treats risk and return as an aggregate. But I think you're quite right. I mean, there, there are, if you look at Individual, there are people willing to invest in make community development funds where they don't want to take a risk, but they're willing, in effect, to sacrifice some return. And then I think in, in much of the impact investing world and development, I think the de-risking is going to be very important to, to getting investors. I think, I think you're quite right. And I think that's actually maybe a, a, a weakness in, in our paper, which you haven't read, but it, it's a weakness where we, we kind of adopt the traditional finance uh, model. John. Yeah, just on this issue of risk and return, I think there are two important points that where the old uh, finance theory breaks down in impact investing. One is we've been accustomed to measuring return on an IRR basis. But if you're focused on an investment that you're going to be in for the next 10 or 15 years, as some impact investors are, IRR may not be the most relevant metric. I mean, you can get a very high IRR by having one very good year and selling out, and then you have to put your money into, uh, you know, two percent treasuries for the rest of the period. And at the end of the day, you know, your your IR from that investment may be high, but your overall return is not so great. You might have been better off to get a six seven percent year on year for the next twenty years and be very happy. Um, the second point on that we've just experienced in terms of risk in the 
in the deal sample that we've dealt with is we see a polarization between deals that are fairly low returning but also low risk because they utilize a lot of uh, uh, risk mitigation from, say, donors and high impact because obviously we wouldn't do anything in the impact investment sector that wasn't high impact. And then at the other extreme, deals that are very high risk because they're at the frontier, in a frontier market, in a new sector, uh, have a decent return, not a Google-type return expectation, but a decent return and high impact. And we don't see a lot in between. So we see a lot where, where, where investors can get something that's less than 5%, but they're taking relatively little risk because, because of the, the sort of uh, grant capital that might be absorbing it. And we see a lot of venture-type deals, but we don't see a lot where you're getting a, you know, a modest return and a modest risk and a high impact. Harold or Agnes, do you want to comment on any of the comments or the question? Yeah, no, I would like to comment on risk because I think that's that's really where we at USAID are trying to figure out how we can help because whether it's taking some sort of first loss positions or whether it's guaranteeing an investment uh, that a new investor might be making it into an impact investing fund uh, where that investor is dipping that toe in the water. I think those are some of the more traditional ways that we've tried to move this along, but um, we're really open to suggestions on to, uh, as far as how we can really move this needle and, uh, and other than supporting the ecosystem, such as GEARS and IRIS and so on, if we can actually make some difference on raising more capital. But not only, I think um, the risk faced by a lot of impact investors also comes from the fact that a lot of enterprises, and this is what John was saying, um, that could have very high impact are not really prepared to receive an investment from a fund. So they need a lot of work, pre-investment, post-investment, to actually be, um, be scaling up at the at the kind of speed that you want them to, to, to get a return, even a single digit return. Uh, and also to, uh, just to, just to be able to deploy the capital in a responsible way. So I think it's really important that, uh, we not only try to support the investment community, but we also try to figure out ways to support the enterprises that could become the recipients of those investments. Yeah, um, well, it's not in my nature to be unduly optimistic on this one. I would say there's actually enough um, examples and working models out there that there's hope in many parts of this um, mosaic. On the uh, de-risking of investment pools through public or charitable money, in microfinance, there's actually a lot of that. It's more on the European side, but I've been involved in there's things like EFSA and huge billion-dollar pools of capital that's just to let banks make otherwise undoable local currency denominated investments in microfinance. The only thing I fault that for is that all of the microfinance players like to kick that under the rug and the fact that microfinance, both the building of the institutions and that sort of thing is a well-kept secret even though they're huge things, you just you, you could even Google and you can't find them. I don't know how they manage that, but it's for obvious reasons. It's because no one wants to tell the story that, of course, microfinance is dealing with a market failure, even the mo or especially the most commercial ones. And again, nothing wrong with that, but it keeps the model being picked up and taken to agriculture or goods and services for the poor. Because if I walk in and say, I need to do the exact same thing that I did for 15 years in microfinance to build agriculture in Africa, you get thrown out of the room saying, that's business, why should we need soft money for that? The bigger issue is on the investment side. I, I think you, that one has hope because there's a model out there, there's returns and you can show, and there's plenty of capital, uh, a lot of it's DFI, but there's private and capital too that's doing what I just described on the, on the underpinning and the soft side. On the investment side, that question uh, Dan asked about sort of, or somebody about, I know John was saying below five and above something. If we take real impact investment, and that's a big question, what is it? First of all, there's, there is a lot that happens at below 5%. A lot of it is like uh, receivables, financing, and things that are relatively safe and securable. That's spectacular, and I mean it. That should keep happening and happen more. But if you look at things that go longer term, riskier, deal with the profound and 10-year issues in these companies, not like selling one purchase order, and I'm not belittling that model, that's a very different story. There is this feeling because a lot of people made money on funds largely because of sell tell or two or three investments, this fiction that uh, the private equity fund business in emerging markets is a 20 or 30% business, 
even with Celtel in it, it wasn't. And I think I say this in my draft response to Paul's article, this is one of these areas I think I know too much. The number of prospective investors in our fund that gave Agnes and me the, as I call it, the go away little boy story. In other words, no, we just invest in, man, uh, Mitchell's laughing. No, we just invest in these 20 or 30% funds. We don't do amateurish things like this. Some of them forget I invested in a lot of those funds. I know what they made. and. Let's say even with these big win Google type winners in, which we're not going to have in this field, uh, you know anyone who can get l even low double digits, uh, low teens on this sort of investment, if it's real social impact, that would be spectacular. It's just no one knows that story. Most real, uh, most people with real capital to invest in this field um, don't, you know, I say don't uh, know it or don't want to admit it admit that. The hope is that now the first generation of private equity funds, even easier ones, uh, the more commercial ones, are the, the track record's coming in. So I think that little dirty secret is getting a lot harder to keep. So these, uh, I, don't know, I won't name any of them, but the ones that are more commercial or raising hundreds of millions of dollars for quote impact investment, if you look at what those have all returned, those track records are coming in uh, from the first round done 10 and 15 years ago. They're high single digits. You know, some of them are low double, but I'm saying if people like us can actually get a high single digit return and show good social impact, I can't imagine there's not more of that kind of capital. It's just that business of transparency and letting people know that what you're getting done on both sides of this divide, that is a hard story to get told. Okay, I want to hear from Mildred Kalir and Bruce McNamer. And then I want to, and Michael Levitt, and then we'll, this woman up front. I would just um, add that I, I think, you know, one of the challenges with impact investing is a lot of it comes in very small, labor-intensive packages. And so this idea of wanting to get to scale, wanting to get to sort of the nirvana of where microfinance was able to, to raise hundreds of millions of dollars and all put it to work in a short space of time, that's a very challenging thing, as Harold has, has said in spades and as Agnes and everybody up there knows. Um, so I think, you know, part of this is about helping the individual enterprises scale, but some of it is, you know, just creating creating in that ecosystem a variety of intermediaries that can scale so that they can each do more and do it in a more streamlined way, you know, whether it's efficiency in fundraising or efficiency in providing technical assistance, you know, coming up with, with um, you know, issues and, and systems that can help solve some of these um, inefficiencies out there. And I think some of what's also happened in the impact space is people have become enamored of the individual transaction. And that's frankly the hardest way to start and where you've got the greatest risk because you've got no diversification. So the fact that, you know, Harold is, is able to raise um, the fund that he did, you know, is going to give those investors a, a chance to see that pooled approach. And that's that's obviously what we at, at CEIF have done in terms of having funds that invest in multiple transactions. We know they aren't going to all succeed, but overall, we hope, uh, and we, we have the experience now to, to show, having made almost 400 investments, that you can achieve you know, those, those high single-digit returns, and you've diversified the risk by not putting all your eggs in one basket. Now the question is, how do the, the entities that are really specializing in this space, how do they scale so that they can great, get greater efficiency and, and do more at the same time we're beginning to experiment in a lot of other areas? Thank you. Pass it down to Bruce McNamer, CEO of TechnoServe. Yeah, just a, a couple of comments. One, uh, reflecting, Harold, on your uh, observation about ecosystems uh, and a role for government, um, you can think about an ecosystem of institutions, but you can also think about a, a sort of systemic approach to investing in a agriculture, for example, in a value chain context, where the opportunity, the enterprise may not be there for that investment if there's been no um, uh, sub, um, uh, 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 investment at the same time at the input supply side or on farmer productivity or at this particular processing. So, you know, the market failure is not at the enterprise level, it's at the value chain level. And to the extent that the U.S. government and others are funding and increasingly funding investment in value chain activities, a tighter integration of the multiple points where investment capital could be deployed uh, would certainly make a hell of a lot of sense. And then the second thing, I'm just shocked uh, to see that still it's the case, Harold, to your point, that there is not this tranching of returns. Uh, and I've yet to see a class of uh, that impact investment that says, I will t I will take a 0% return in order to goose the return for that neutral, for that socially neutral investor to come in there. Because really, back to Dean Brass's point, a lot of the, or the real impetus for impact investing ought to be crowding in folks into an area where they're just not familiar with the risks. And just a related point, it's on the uh, 
or greater than 5%. Sometimes those are the unsexiest sort of uh, areas to invest, but the returns ought to be accruing to local institutions, to local banks, for example, who are just not lending, for example, there because of unfamiliarity with the risk. Uh, and it can be the role for impact investing with loan guarantees and the like, with all kinds of ways of mitigating risk to get the banks in and operating in areas they otherwise wouldn't go. Um, I don't know how to modernize this, but we were talking earlier about the success of the enterprise funds or some of the enterprise funds. And one of the things that I think uh, allowed some of it to work, we were a technical assistance provider. We were funded by AID in all the same countries the enterprise funds were working in, totally disconnected from the enterprise funds. But we could provide the enterprise funds with experts to do the due diligence didn't go against the return. And then once the money went into a company, we would supply them with COOs or whatever it did and help build their skills and markets. So we were, I think, making a real contribution at the success of the enterprise levels without having to change the, re the apparent return. And I don't know how we do that anymore, but I think it was a significant, not just my organization, but others, made a significant contribution to the success of the enterprise funds, both by contributing to the due diligence phase, because we would go in and knock out companies, or there'd be companies that would be close, they'd be get near the sniff test, and we'd get them over the hump to at least prepare them to go after the, successfully get the dough. Well, that was the different generation of AID where, you know, all the good guy TA providers got a bunch of dough to operate in Georgia, Russia, Czech Republic, Hungary, whatever it was. Half the enterprise funds wouldn't let us in. The ones that were run by Wall Street guys were offended by the idea of having these TA providers. And the ones that were run by Main Street, and they were all guys, the Main Street guy said, y'all come, if you can do this and help us, we'll take your fr free help, all funded by, again, standing AID grants to provide, it wasn't called capacity building, whatever we called it in the 90s, um, TA, um, and we just tied it to the, to the enterprise funds. Okay, this, this woman up front, I, I, we'll do another round, but I want to just get this one last person up front, and then we're going to call on some others in the back. Uh, thank you to the panel for everything that you've shared with us today. My name is Giselle Aris, and I work with the International Development Division of Land Lakes, and I had two questions for the panel. The first relates to something that John already touched on, which is that as there's increasing invest, impact investing funds flowing, it doesn't necessarily, there's still a gap between investment readiness of a lot of enterprises you work with. So there's been a growth um, of organizations, including Land Lakes International, that are playing the role of enterprise accelerator or business incubator. And I wanted thoughts from the panel on what you think is working on that piece of the impact investing process, what's not, and any words of advice or insight that you would give on that. Uh, my second question is for Agnes specifically. Land Lakes has a couple of projects in Kenya and Tanzania where we in many ways act like an impact investment fund for agriculture technology businesses. So giving funding as, as, as well as technical assistance and bringing them to graduation. And some of these businesses are, are really large in scope and part of our the scope of the projects in general is to make them financially sustainable beyond the life of the project. So I wanted to hear from you, how can we inter interact with Private Capital Group on Africa um, for future years? So Agnes, can we ask you to respond to that? Why don't you take that question first and then I know, Paul, there were several questions and comments directed towards you and others. Yep. Sure. So. Um Oh. Hi. So on enterprise accelerators, because that's basically what your both of your questions are kind of focused on. Um, you know, when I was a GBF, frankly, I still did not see that the enterprise accelerators that did exist were really integrated with whoever was really looking for the deals. I don't have an answer of why that was, but it's it was still, even though we talked to each other here in DC in the field, it looked very different. And I think that there was huge potential to really 
connect any enterprise accelerators, not only with impact investment funds, but also with local banks, as, as I think Bruce was saying. Um, on my group, an enterprise accelerator, so basically we work with the missions. So to the extent that Kenya Mission is interested in developing a program that would then be also linking the enterprises that you guys are developing with local financiers, I think that's great. But in fact, that should already be part of your program. So basically, I think that um, all enterprise accelerators should not just build the capacity of the businesses, but also have some ideas for where they should go to raise some financing and should be part of that community. So that that's really my answer to the question in that I think that A, the Kenya mission, but also B, really making sure that whatever you're actually, when you're proposing the programs to USAID, that you're building in that finance component because a lot of times it is lacking from a lot of proposals that we get and it's, it's absolutely integral. I just wanted to respond to, to Bruce's question about, about whether there are examples of, of people backstopping. Uh, and one, one which I think probably John has a broader knowledge of than I do, but some social impact bonds uh, depend. The New, here's the, the, the current um, New York recidivism bond in which the Bloomberg Foundation is backstopping uh, Goldman Sachs, which is sort of a market investor, although Goldman Sachs is probably taking a larger risk than, than it would on, on other investments. Their, their upside will be pretty good if the bond pays off. Yeah. So they, they have very limited downside. And, go, and, and, very decent and Bloomberg is limiting the downside. Given that the Goldman Sachs investment is about $10 million, you wonder why they just didn't write it off to the public relations, but that's a different question. <laughs> John. Actually, it's worth mentioning something on that. So as I understand that, that deal um, from the folks there, um, and, uh, I don't know if anyone from here is from Goldman Sachs who can contradict me. If not, I'll say what I was going to say. Um, they did that deal largely as a PR deal. Um, uh, the mayor wanted to get paid for a performance going in, his, um, uh, uh, in the city. He was able to talk to folks at Goldman, and they were able to structure the deal in a way that passed Goldman's compliance requirements and still uh, 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 re uh, 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 created uh, uh, the pay performance model the mayor wanted. But what they've said is since they um, did that deal, they've been getting calls from all over the place. They've already done a second deal. And they've been getting calls from all over the place to do more of these things. And they're actually looking at raising a fund to do a number of things, including more, th more of these types of bonds. So it does speak a bit to the demand out there for people to find more than just financial return from their capital. Now, whether at the end of the day they're willing to put their money into a deal that has real risk associated with the, 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 the social return as well as the financial return, I think is an open question. But they, you know, they've actually geared up a whole effort here where one didn't exist because of the, the publicity they got from that. Um, to, to one other point, though, about that, how you can use one investor's money to help create a different return for another investor. I mean, there's another example sitting right in front of us where two of the people in the front row uh, invested in the medical credit fund. One of them got a higher return than the other, and that lower return was able to bring in the, the, re the return from the, from, from the other. Uh, and they can tell you if they want to, who, which is which. But um, the result of that was, you know, in a deal that had five investors, two investors, one public, one private, were willing to take a lower return to allow three other private investors to come in with a slightly higher return. And so that, uh, that model, I think, exists, and I think it can, you can find other examples, and I think there are real, real potential for it. Okay, there's a, there's a woman back there who's got her hand up. Good afternoon. I found this extremely fascinating. I come from the foreign aid world. I work with Congressional Research Service, and I do global health. And I came to this session because I've been concerned about the direction and the trends that I think global health is going in. I think uh, global health has reached its peak in terms of excitement and investments in it. And I thought that listening to this might give ideas about how impact investment could be used to in, can address issues of global health, particularly in developing countries where people live in impoverished conditions and health is related to poor poverty. So if any of you can give examples of how it's been done or what can be done. Yeah, okay. Other comments from the audience? That's the last round here. So uh, I'm going to, this woman here in the middle, Maggie, this woman right here. 
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Rosemary Segero. Um, we just in a process finishing our invest. We have started an investment fund which focus on small and medium businesses in East Africa, Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania, Rwanda, and Burundi. I want to commend on Mr. Harold Rosen for the work you the, for the speech on African investments. How do you compare now the in, the impact of investment in Africa now comparing to China, which is more valuable? And what do you see looking at China? Are you going to do the same work, or how do you get into it comparing the the really impact of especially on the ground and in the rural areas, working with small and medium businesses or just uh, investment. Thank you. Okay. The gentleman in front here, blue shirt. Yeah. Hi, I'm Tony Amer from Mercy Corps. I come from an investment banking background and joined Mercy Corps about nine months ago. Mm. And, um, what I want to say is something Harold and John touched on primarily in saying, talking about transparency and talking about the difficulty of raising funds for impact primarily at the right time and from the right people. In the private banking world, it's fairly much easier to raise funds because you know who invests in what and how. However, in the impact world, it's a lot more difficult uh, due to the lack of transparency, not just within um, the between the investee and the investor, but due to the inability of, of nobody knows who's investing in what and why due to the risk, due to the idea that as much as we think it's an old industry, it's fairly new to a lot of people. And so what do you guys think we can do in, in the near future to change that and <clears throat> facilitate this industry going forward and, and make it far more easier to, to mobilize capital, whether grant or, or investment capital, to move things forward? Okay, uh, John Simon, can I ask you to take the health question? Uh, sure. Uh, it, you know, it, it's um, there's a range of things that are amenable to impact investment, and there there are things that are not. Uh, and I think that one of the one of the tasks when we look at development holistically, and we think about impact investment as a tool to to to, to um, promote development. We have to be, be judicious in terms of identifying, if we're allocating capital, what areas really can utilize investment as a tool and what areas really make sense to have uh, more, more of the old grant-funded model. I think today, if you look at the development agencies, they're heavily weighted more towards the grant model than they could be. I think there's a lot that can be done, including in the health sector, to move towards more um, uh, investment type models. Medical credit fund I referred to before is, is one such situation. Um, we're looking to generate investment with uh, Mirza in a hospital, in a tertiary hospital in, in Pakistan. Again, using investment instead of grant, which is what was used before. Uh, I think health infrastructure writ large, both at the facility level, at the sort of payment processing level, at the health worker training level. Health worker training is something that, you know, there's a huge dearth of health workers throughout the developing world, and you can imagine a profitable model that's able to produce that. But I think people have to be very wary of using, you know, of having a hammer and thinking everything looks like a nail. There's still a very strong role for grant funding in a whole ecosystem like health. And, you know, I think there's, that you, we can push a lot farther with where we can apply investment, but we do have to be careful about turning everything into, into an investment. Okay, Harold, China, Africa. Let me just add one thing to what John said about health and having been part of some of the, both IFC and then GBF when we're inside IFC, looking for health things to do in Africa at the enterprise level. I think John is right that there is, in principle, a lot of things out there that are starting to happen, that could happen. But as far as investable transactions that could receive even mostly commercial capital and uh, still get the job done in outlying areas of tough African countries, I think we're still a long ways off of that. And I think the IFC experience, there was a, a large thing they've done with McKinsey to look all over East Africa. I believe the experience is it's a lot harder than it sounds to find things that can receive and use capital for those sorts of things. Same story, of course there are things that could be shaped, but even more than agriculture, I would say those are gonna be 
tough, take a lot of capacity building, and the history of both infrastructure and healthcare is that most governments are going to not be that happy if they see investors making what looks like a commercial return off their poor people. That was true in infrastructure funds in Asia. That was That's even more true in health. And especially given this concern about like what happened with microfinance in India, not that that was a See, it taints the whole field, but in a way it gets people thinking, so are we going to let private investors make a good return off taking care of poor people in rural Kenya? I think the answer is watch out, or at least make sure you got the segmentation of capital so somebody with the right incentives is going to be in for first loss or that sort of thing. Uh, let me just talk a little bit about, I also wanted to say about the um, Africa-China business. It was a good question, and a lot of people say to me, why are you, I mean, I made a personal commitment when we set up GBF that we're going to do at least half of what we do in sub-Saharan Africa. No one told us we had to do that, but I felt like for my time, in, and I'm not picking on the World Bank Group, it's the same elsewhere, I think, the mentality in the world is, well, let's start with the easier places, like middle-income countries, and if we can make it work there, then we'll get to Africa. And somehow we never got around to helping in tough African countries. And maybe, maybe not did we succeed in the Turkeys and Mexicos of the world. But you walk around any African country and say, so where is all this impact investment? Or where are the agencies? I'm guessing in your country, too, you say, well, that seems like they say they spend a lot of money and not much of it gets down to things that help people help themselves. So um, my sense is Africa has plenty of good entrepreneurship. There are better opportunities. Uh, I will confess I've stayed away from China partly just because it's big, hairy, and it doesn't feel like it needs help from people like us. I've tried to go around this the other way and say, let's start on tough places. And I track very carefully the GNP per capita and the development level of where our money goes. And I always say, if I start having a profile on that score that looks anything like even the DFIs, I should be put out of business because there's lots of other people that will invest in middle income countries. So that's one thing is I don't think there's enough sort of uh, tagging to the, let's, you know, in figure skating, they give a score for technical merit and then another for uh, difficulty factor. I think somehow there ought to be, you know, a dollar of economic value creation ought to be higher in places where it's tougher or the income's lower. We're, stay tuned, we're working on a system for this. Uh, try When we start getting metrics, I see Eric and Manuel here cringing that uh, what's he going to think of next? But. There is a reason for that, and I think that's something we got to do because not many people are going to want, even India is a question, but China to put soft or charitable money into creating social impact in those places. You can make an argument, but I think that's going to be harder. In Africa, there's so much money washing over the place, and there's so much of it that looks like it could be better spent. I'm optimistic. I think if you look at the technical assistance money that gets spent I was going to say blown, but let's say spent. In uh, most African countries, a very small percentage of that would make a very big difference for the kind of volume and type of enterprises in things like health. Uh, the, the question of what could we actually do, I, I want to say, that because the incubator question kind of relates to this, it is a very good point. Incubators ought to work very well. There is a very big gap between what comes out of even the best of the incubators and what becomes of a size and type that even people like us can invest in. I think the reason for this is the gap doesn't get addressed. You need commercial smarts, but you need some kind of cushion to do that. And it's too small and too funky even for us because now we have to service investors. It's that. It's, you know, there's plenty of incubators. There's lots of people like us sort of looking for deals and even ready to help them. But it's that bridging period that that's why I'm saying local mentoring or why I'd like to involve local business people. Somehow we've got to find a way to get what comes out of those incubators to, you know, if they get in front of the wrong group of investors and there's this whoosh of let's just make it grow as fast as possible. That's usually what happens at business plan competitions and, you know, selection panels. You've all been part of these. And I stay away from them now just because I've seen so many cases where literally the whole story is how to, as we call it, used to call it, and I see how to powder your nose. In other words, do a PowerPoint, gull some Silicon Valley investor into putting $5 million in, and the enterprise is hollow sometimes. Or in cases like India, sometimes the government and the regulatory environment forces you to have valuation discussions before there's an enterprise. That's the problem, is to get the wrong flavor of capital coming in at the wrong time can ruin an enterprise, and I've seen plenty of that. It's that matching the kind of capital to the stage of the enterprise is just a really hard thing to do, when you, especially when you're a fund and you have to do volume. And these things don't lend themselves to a lot of volume. Agnes, do you want to take the Mercy Corps question? From what I recall, the Mercy Corps question was about why there isn't more information about who is doing what. 
and that's why it's difficult to raise financing? Or misinformation. Or misinformation? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, um, I think there's a lot of attempts to really try to address that. I know that Jen has been doing quite a bit on trying to collect information from various impact investing funds. So has Andy, or Vandal Kempners here, who heads that. They've really been trying to, like I said, infuse a lot more transparency into what's happening. It is a fairly new industry when you think about it, especially on um, as far as collection of information is concerned. So I think it's going to take some time, but I think it's it's going to get there. And I, I think that that's what everyone is saying when they're talking about building the ecosystem. Um, so I think it's going to get there, and I think I'm actually very positive about that because the information is definitely forthcoming. I want to thank the panel. I want to especially thank Paul Brest for coming all the way from California to do this for us. So please join me in thanking the panel.